So, I've just been reading Susan Crockford's latest book called Fallen Icon. It's about Sir David Attenborough and the walrus deception. It's pretty amazing when you realize the power of the World Wildlife Fund, or World Wide Fund, whatever they call themselves now, WWF, you know, the environmental group that has a panda as its logo. Anyway, it's an excellent book, and I bring it up because the story that I want to read you is a paper that I did, which is a rebuttal to a paper that attacked Dr. Susan Crockford. And, um, you know, polar bears, of course, have always been a big part of the climate movement. It's really sort of the icon for disaster. It's uh, the reason Greta Thunberg stated that she fell into a depression because she was shown, as a young girl at school, a video of a dying polar bear, and it made an indelible uh, impression upon her. And of course, that's, that's tragic. I don't know how many of you remember, there was actually a cult of the climate polar bear in the form of Knut. And Knut was a baby polar bear that was adopted by a zookeeper at um, the Berlin Zoo. And there was a huge cult following, and they even made this little Knut bear. <laughs> and he is pretty cute, Knut. So anyway, my paper revolves around that, and it's a rebuttal to the things that uh, were said in the paper um, that uh, attacked Susan Crockford. So I'm just going to read it. So it's a long read. I um, hope you'll bear with me if you feel like hearing a story on a snowy day like today. It's called The Cult of the Climate Change Polar Bear. Knut is dead. Long live Knut. So the abstract says, um, Harvey et al. 2017 evaluate public commentary on internet web diaries or blogs about polar bear science as a proxy to measure climate change denial, a term used to delegitimize dissenting views on anthropogenic global warming, AGW, and climate change. Greenpeace has long employed the polar bear in its advocacy advertising for climate change action. The animal achieved cult status in 2005 when a polar bear cub nicknamed Knut was rejected by its mother at the Berlin Zoo. He was adopted and raised by a German zookeeper to the delight of the public worldwide. Knut's appearance on the world stage coincided with the release of the climate change movie An Inconvenient Truth, billed as by far the most terrifying film you'll ever see. Knut's rise to fame overshadowed the work of a National Academy's press report that questioned the validity of the radiative forcing greenhouse gas theory of human-caused global warming. Knut died in public on March 19, 2011, drowning in the waters of his own enclosure. This paper deconstructs Harvey et al. 2017 and the framing of climate change in relation to polar bears and Knut, addressing influences in financial markets and the value of the Internet Public Forum. Cult of the Climate Change Polar Bear Knut is dead, long live Knut. Everything that was bad about the world could be easily expressed by the image of a lone bear on a melting piece of ice. That's a quote from Zach Unger's book, Never Look a Polar Bear in the Eye. And it's a fantastic book. I highly recommend it. <clears throat> Climate change is one of the most complex interdisciplinary fields of study, characterized by atmospheric scientist Dr. Judith Curry as the, quote, mother of all super messy, wicked problems, a field where processes are so entangled with each other, it's nearly impossible to unravel them to define any singular cause and effect. Thus, to affect public policy, environmental non-governmental groups, ENGOs, such as Greenpeace, that advocate for public policy on conservation or climate change, have developed powerful imagery to act as a shortcut 
for their message. A polar bear stranded on a small ice floe surrounded by a vast expanse of frigid water is, on some levels, a more effective form of emotional manipulation than a Fijian islander claiming that human-caused sea level rise will sweep their nation away. Humans can be relocated and financially compensated. Innocent polar bears whose ice flows melt away must drown and die, and it's all your fault. Or so the public is led to believe. Harvey et al., 2017, argue that internet blogs that dispute certain facts or portrayals about Arctic sea ice or polar bears are, by proxy, denying climate change. This paper deconstructs Harvey et al.'s claims and explores the framing of AGW as an anthropomorphized animal totem cult and reviews coincident financial market influence on the message. So the method that I employed in this paper, various key claims of Harvey et al. are reviewed and discussed. In principle, as per their reference to Pym and Harvey, 2002, the paper examines the five criteria for the truth for web surfers. One, follow the data. Two, follow the language. Three, follow the credentials and question self-manufactured evidence. Four, follow the money. And five, uncover the conspiracy. Harvey et al. state that, most importantly, any topic can be framed in exactly the way a communicator desires if it is not presented objectively, honestly, and with context. So, one, follow the data. A, global warming or cooling. Harvey et al. opened their discussion with claims of the hottest year on record, referring to two of the same sources used by the World Meteorological Organization, or the WMO. On January 18, 2017, the WMO issued a press release stating that 2016 had been the hottest year on record. The press release focuses on sea ice melt and states that the Arctic is warming faster than other parts of the world. The press release states in the notes to newspaper editors that there is a margin of uncertainty of plus or minus 0.09 degrees Celsius in the anomaly value. Was the meaning of the data clearly conveyed to the public? The late Professor Istvan Marko summarized it at the time by saying, knowing that 2016 is supposedly hotter by 0.02 degrees Celsius, that's two one-hundredths of a degree, than 2015, and that the error on this value is 0.1 degrees Celsius, we see the absurdity of this statement. For those who don't understand right now, this means that the variation in temperature could be a plus 0.12 degrees Celsius, warmer, or minus 0.08 degrees Celsius, cooler. In short, we can't say anything, and the WMO has simply lost their mind. The public does not realize that global mean temperatures are a construct of temperature data from many sources, depending on the specific data set or sets employed. And these have been adjusted, homogenized, and averaged as a metric. And in quotes here, I have the temperature field of the Earth as a whole is not thermodynamically representable by a single temperature. And that's a quote from Essex, McKittrick, and Andres Andreessen of 2006. By failing to state the parameters of uncertainty, uncertainty properly, a form of self-manufactured evidence is presented to the public by an authoritative body. So I'm saying that the WMO did not properly set the context when they claimed that this was a record hot year. And B, consensus. Harvey et al. claim that the vast majority of sciences, scientists agree that AGW is driven by rising greenhouse gas concentrations, or GHGs, referring to several so-called consensus studies. So now I review some of those. 
Doran and Zimmerman, 2009, asks two opinion questions on an empirical topic and never even mentions GHGs. Stenhouse et al., 2014, does mention GHGs and asks opinion questions like those of Doran and Zimmerman, 2009. If humans have contributed to warming in the past 150 years, yeah, probably. The International or the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change (IPCC) declaration of 2007 refers to human causation only since 1950, or about 67 years. Carlton et al., which is another consensus study, surveys non-climate scientists, only mentions GHGs once and talks about anthropogenic climate change, not global warming. Causation is simply split between humans and nature, with no definitive cause or ratio attached. Another consensus study, Verhagen et al. 2015, is more precise. The fundamental question paralleled that of the IPCC AR4 report, Declaration on Anthropogenic GHG Concentrations. Verhagen et al. 2015 does not mention harm or escalation. Cook et al., another consensus study of 2013, refers to the IPCC 2007 declaration on GHGs and mentions ecosystems once with reference only to impacts but not harms. Extreme weather is not an expected outcome of human-caused global warming. Curry, 2014. So these are consensus studies that the authors Harvey et al. referred to, and I've just shown that there's a number of inconsistencies and that they're actually not referring to greenhouse gases at all, disputing what Harvey et al. wrote. C. What does the clear separation of denier blog positions represent? So just to go back a bit, in the Harvey paper, they went through a survey of various internet blogs and picked out those who they claimed were deniers and who were using polar bear science work by Susan Crockford as their supporting evidence, which these authors say is incorrect. Uh, they dispute Susan Crockford's findings, even though Dr. Crockford actually uses the research papers of the mainstream polar bear scientists to prove her points. <laughs> anyway, so let's go back to this. So part C, what does the clear separation of denier blog positions represent? Harvey et al. analyzed 45 science-based blogs and 45 science deniers uh, blogs. Harvey et al. initiated this term, by the way, and found the groups to be diametrically opposed. The science-based blogs overwhelmingly used the frame of established scientific certainties, quoting Harvey there. A review of the 100-year daytime temperature averages on yourenvironment.ca in the Canadian Arctic centers of Churchill, Manitoba and Inuit, Inuvik Northwest Territories shows no discernible rise in daytime average temperatures in any season. According to an interview with Arctic researcher in hydrology, Dr. Ian Clark, during the Holocene Hipsy Thermal of about 8,000 years ago, the Arctic region was warm and lush, and polar bears adapted and survived. Unlike the Antarctic, which is a land mass cloaked in ice, the Arctic is a polar ice cap that floats over a sea of changing warm and cold currents. In recent history, Roald Amundsen traversed the Northwest Passage in 1906, and the RCMP's St. Roche boat also traversed it in 1942, suggesting that there's uh, cyclical ice-free conditions prior to human influence on global warming. According to Dowsley, 2008, polar bear trophy hunting and ecotourism is an important financial contributor to Inuit communities and a means of managing polar bear populations. Polar bear hunting is restricted in Canada to Aboriginal people or hunters guided by Aboriginal experts. If bears are truly at risk of extinction, the public would question this right to hunt bears. 
Thus, the Harvey et al. findings of a consensus view by the science-based blogs on the AGW certainty and the threat to polar bear survival may also suggest possible confirmation bias, such as that referred to in Michaels and Balling, 2009. The singling out of one polar bear researcher by name in Harvey et al. seems very unusual. The acknowledged standard for responsible conduct in science is described as, science has progressed through a uniquely productive marriage of human creativity and hard-nosed skepticism of openness to new scientific contributions and persistent questioning of those contributions and the existing scientific consensus. And that's from the National Academies Press, 1995, on being a scientist, responsible conduct in research. So intent to harm is identified as a form of type two scientific misconduct. And that's from Caboulet, 2013. So number two, follow the language. Competing definitions of climate change. PLK 2005 addressed one of the most confounding issues in the climate debate, misdefining climate change consequences for science and action. References in Harvey et al. Um, to dangerous human-caused warming due to GHGs are based on the UNFCCC, that's the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, a political definition of climate change. Indeed, as PLK 2005 points out, danger is a relative term. A floodplain is not dangerous to anyone until someone builds there, such as during the California mega floods of 1861 and 1862, from Brewer, 1930. B. Follow the language of visual mythology, a charismatic polar bear. And here's a quote. Polar bears are born with their eyes closed, weighing about the mass of a squirrel. That's from the Center for Biological Diversity polar bear webpage masthead. The orphaned Knut brought a cuddly charismatic face of climate change to millions of people at the Berlin Zoo and via the Knut cult that developed worldwide around him. Knut was born and became famous in the same year that Al Gore's climate catastrophe prophecy film, An Inconvenient Truth, was released, which featured animation of a swimming polar bear marooned in a vast open sea hopelessly pawing at a tiny life raft ice flow that disintegrated. Adorable photos of Knut nibbling on the fingers of zookeeper Thomas Dorflin, nose-to-nose -nose kisses, or the two curled up together for a nap, were the ultimate images of humans in harmony with nature. C. Names, name-calling and hyperbole. As early as 2004, Greenpeace was claiming to save the planet. We had to save the polar bears. Greenpeace says polar bears are more than just a poster child. Indeed, polar bears became a silent but instantly recognizable icon of human-caused, warmer, catastrophic future. One rarely questioned, even with hyperbolic statements from Greenpeace like these. Studies estimate that a 7-meter, 23-foot rise in global sea level would result from this melt. Cities at sea level such as Los Angeles, London and Amsterdam would be inundated. In the U.S., the coastlines of Florida and Louisiana would move inland. Thus, parties that bring up inconvenient facts about polar bear survival fitness are easily identified as heretical climate change deniers a term employed by the climate change movement since its early days. Indeed, <clears throat> in 2005, James Hogan of Dismog Blog stated, 
These are not debunkers testing out right, outrageous claims with scientific rigor. They are deniers, like Holocaust deniers, shouting against a truth that they find economically unpalatable. They're not using science. They're using a toxic concoction of public relations stunts of which any good PR professional should be ashamed. And that's James Hogan, the smog blog. He runs a PR firm. <laughs> So, accused of manufacturing doubt, it was then easy to dismiss and delegitimize any dissenting scientist or public figure by embedding fear of using fossil fuels and causing GHG emissions equals pollution, dirty, and imminent catastrophe climate change, death. Financiers of renewables, which provide long-term stable financial returns, profitable subsidies, tax write-offs, and ancillary investment markets and other vested interests like natural gas or transmission line developers and environmental groups acting as proxies for them, these all combined easily proliferated their fearful message. Hyperbole became the business of climate change language, especially for Leviathan ENGOs with multi-million dollar payrolls to make. An example revealed in the recent Resolute Forest Products versus Greenpeace discoveries. This was a big court case between a forestry company which sued Greenpeace for defamation. And in the discoveries, that's the period of time when each party has to show what their evidence is to the other party. Uh, these come out in court. Um, so in that time period, one of these uh, things was found that in 2006, Greenpeace USA mistakenly issued a press release stating, in the 20 years since the Chernobyl tragedy, the world's worst nuclear accident, there have been nearly, and then there's a space there and it says, fill in alarmist and Armageddonist factoid here. <laughs> so this is one of their press releases that went out but nobody filled in that spot. So it shows that they tend to um, inflate and exaggerate their claims. And as for sea level rise that allegedly threatens the polar bear in the world, if we follow the data, we find that Greenpeace headquarters are in the Netherlands, where about 21% of the country is below sea level. <laughs> some parts as much as almost seven meters below sea level, and Skiffold Airport itself is three meters below sea level. Sea level rise is about 1.5 millimeters per century, so that's the equivalent of about two dimes stacked on each other. Archaeological evidence shows that many regions such as Doggerland and people such as the Mesolithic Star Car have been lost to the waters or forced to move on, meaning that sea level rise and fall is something that's happened over time throughout history, throughout Earth's history and throughout human history. And uh, sometimes people adapt like the Dutch and they build dikes and the delta work system to pump out the uh, seawater and groundwater. And sometimes people don't like the Doggerland area and the Star Car people, they had to move on. And Doggerland is that area between the UK and the mainland of Europe in the, in the sea there in the um, English Channel. So it sank by itself. <laughs> anyway, so now we move to number three. Follow the credentials, the climate reality, dissent, and lack of evidence. In 2005, the same year that Knut was born and adopted by humans, the National Academies Press issued a publication called Radiative Forcing of Climate Change, Expanding the Concept and Exploring the Uncertainties, 2005, which questioned the validity of the radiative forcing theory of GHGs. That's the theory that carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases retain heat and cause global warming. Warming. So this is the National Academies that are questioning this fundamental theory. 
In a summary of the work states, whereas emphasis to date has been on how these climate forcings affect global mean temperature, the report finds that regional variation and climate impacts other than temperature deserve increased attention. So they're saying that that's not the main driver of climate change. By 2013, the IPCC, that's the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, was reporting that there had been a hiatus of some, in warming of some 15 years to 2012 that had not been predicted in a single climate model. Though there appears to be broad scientific agreement on fundamental principles that global warming has occurred since 1860, and that since 1950s, humans have affected global warming to some degree, there is significant dissent on many aspects within the science community. A clear example is found in the transcript of the American Physical Society's 2014 Climate Change Statement Review Workshop. In the transcript, this group of six scientists all members of the same society but with different qualifications and areas of study and this included Dr. John Christie, Dr. William Collins, Dr. Judith Curry, Dr. Isaac Held, Dr. Richard Lindzen, and Dr. Ben Santer. They all had very different perspectives on climate change. These scientists noted that many internal climate variables operate on scales of 60, 100, 1500, even 3,000 year cycles and more. While scientists work with 40 to 100 years of inconsistent temperature and data on the cycle of natural systems. Scientists do not have a complete database upon which to make long-term reliable predictions. Clouds are a major factor, but they cannot be modeled. So, one of the scientists in this group, Dr. Christie, is a firm advocate of observable evidence. His March 29, 2017 testimony to the U.S. Senate shows that the IPCC's computer simulated climate models have significantly overestimated warming, creating an aura of climate alarmism that is not supported by the observed evidence. In a summary blog post by Darwall, the APS workshop revealed that climate models are scaled up or down to make them match observations, but these scalings are not used on IPCC's long-term 100-year projections. This confounded one of the forum moderators, Dr. Stephen Coonan, who noted that this probably results in a 20 to 35 percent over-projection of the 2100 warming. And uh, by the way, Dr. Coonan was so alarmed by his uh, experience in this workshop that he ended up writing a book called Unsettled because he realized that climate science is far from settled uh, just by being the moderator at this uh, workshop. And uh, by the way, he was Obama's science advisor so it's not like he was some guy from left field or wearing a tinfoil hat. He's a real scientist and was uh, granted great authority in the Obama administration. How you doing, Knut? cute little guy. So number four, follow the money. Harvey et al. claim there is dark money driving the denier faction. This comment ignores the cumulative financial power from mainstream philanthropic foundations pushing the complier view of consensus on catastrophic climate change. The sequence of the rollout of power and influence which happened to coincide with Knut <laughs> suggests it's more a case of global commercial opportunism than conspiracy. As reported by Lawrence Solomon, in 1993, Enron was paying environmental groups, ENGOs, to push their renewables and natural gas agenda. 
which had made them a bundle of money on emissions trading, and which they saw could be formalized under the Kyoto Accord as, quote, the biggest money plays, the rules governing emissions trading, the rules governing transfers of emission reduction rights between countries, and the rules governing a gargantuan clean energy fund. So the Kyoto Accord was a predecessor to the Paris Agreement that people talk about today. And Enron was a company that uh, was at one point deemed to be one of the best country companies in uh, North America, but it kind of collapsed in a, a state of fraudulent accounting literally overnight. So efforts to establish these three elements on a global scale persist to this day. So that's the biggest money plays, the rules governing emissions trading, the rules governing transfers of emission reduction rights between countries, and the rules governing a gargantuan clean energy fund. So people are still trying to put this into place. Big Climate is now a $1.5 trillion a year global industries and that doesn't include the environmental groups who feed off it. And it relies on the premise that carbon dioxide and greenhouse gases uh, from human-caused industry are a dangerous global warming agent and that by mitigating carbon dioxide we can stop global warming and climate change. So most corporations and the world of finance have either voluntarily adopted this AGW stance to retain access to institutional investment funds and bank finance, or because they can make more money or have better access to off-limits Aboriginal resources by being under the climate change catastrophe umbrella. Elaine Dewar in 1995 revealed in her book A Cloak of Green that corporate opportunism was not shy about greenwashing on a grand scale to gain access to untapped resources held on the lands of Indigenous people, often with the environmental groups opening the door. With a combined population base of between 250 to 350 million people, Indigenous people are sitting on land that holds more than 50 percent of the world's undeveloped mineral resources. If counted as a nation, Indigenous people would be the sixth largest nation on the planet. International Funders of Indigenous Peoples' Ninth Annual Conference Report, 2010, explores various methods of how offshore corporate and foundation-funded ENGOs work with Indigenous people, often against sovereign governments, but not really on behalf of the Indigenous people. Consequently, by climate change cultists adopting the spirit annual uh, animal of the Inuit people, the polar bear, as an icon of the climate change movement, this is very influential, and it appears to honor Aboriginal people. Chapin, 2004, of World Watch Institute reported on such corporateer conservationists. They, they write, they see themselves as scientists doing God's work, says one critic pointing out the conservation ascent of a divine mission to save the earth. Armed with science, they define the terms of engagement. Then they invite the indigenous residents to participate in the agenda that they have laid out. If the indigenous people don't like the agenda, they'll simply be ignored. I think there's been a shift says a key official at one of the major foundations that have supported the conservationist environmental groups, a shift away from building local capacity by helping to launch local ENGOs that can then work with the indigenous communities in their own countries. These groups now see themselves as semi-permanent international organizations that are not going to work themselves out of a job. So a new angle entered the discussion on climate change in 2005, a legal angle. A lawsuit, from, a lawsuit from a group called the Center for Biological Diversity argued that polar bears could be used as a roundabout way 
to enact climate change legislation. And that's from Zach Unger's book, 2013, and it's Kindle Reader, page 85. Now, curiously, Desmog Blog was formed in 2005, a blog site developed by an acolyte of Al Gore's and an expert public relations man. The blog makes a detailed list of deniers. In 2007, Al Gore and the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC, won a Nobel Peace Prize for their work on global warming. Knut celebrated his big day and multi-million dollar celebrity status with a cake, but no seal meat. The birthday boy himself reportedly celebrated his big day with a cake of ice cream, fruit, and vegetables topped off with croissants and grapes and served up by Keeper Thomas Dorflin. So, the spirit animal doesn't even get to eat his native food, which would be seals. So we're continuing to assess this according to Harvey et al's parameters. And now we're on number five, uncover the conspiracy. Commercial opportunism that is out in the open and legal cannot be described as a conspiracy. But looking at the evidence, the confluence of powerful forces is clear. The parties involved do not acknowledge scientific uncertainties or that the GHG theory's validity is in question. They use the UNFCCC's political definition of climate change. Two major players are the CDP Worldwide and the UNPRI. So the CDP Worldwide is the Carbon Disclosure Project and the UNPRI is the United Nations Principles for Responsible Investment. These are both transnational, unelected, unaccountable groups with tremendous power. Um, and low carbon sustainable investments are premised on the catastrophic AGW GHG theory. The CDP Worldwide, formerly the Carbon Disclosure Project, a Rockefeller Philanthropy Advisors charity, is situated in the UK and was established in 2002. Its purpose is to gather voluntary greenhouse gas emissions reports from cities and corporations to inform investors of sustainability factors. So CDP effectively creates a white and black list. The whitelisted players get institutional investors because they are signatory to the UNPRI. Blacklisted players face divestment and private funds do not need to sign with the UNPRI. So in one way, those divested things could be picked up by private companies. Um, and in this way, vulture investors could profit. So these, are, these two organizations are really skewing international markets, investment markets. The United Nations Principles for Responsible Investment, UNPRI, was established in 2005. Here's that date again. And now has some 1,800 signatories with some $100 trillion in assets under management. Most of the signatories are institutional investors, large corporations, and academic beneficent pension fund plans that pledge to invest in sustainable development and are to follow the UNPRI's six principles. As Nisbet 2014 reports, a group of large foundations made a coordinated plan in 2007 to change world energy policies by funding local, non-governmental organizations, becoming active as the multi-million or multi-billion dollar climate works. Most of these foundations had been under investigation by the RISI committee in the 1950s for undue influence on society. And that's from Wormser, 1993. By 2014, the U.S. Senate Minority Committee was reporting the chain of environmental command, how a club of billionaires and their foundations control the environmental movement and Obama's EPA. In 2014, UNPRI were asking members to sign the Montreal Carbon Pledge. 
by 2015, Canadian pension trustees were being told that climate change denial is not an option. Kosky and Minsky, 2015. In 2016, the UNPRI signatory firms also pledged to lobby corporations and governments in their own countries, especially Canada, the US, and Australia, that were non-compliant on climate change. The UNPRI was making every effort to force national security organizations to require that all corporations include climate risk assessments in securities reporting. Now just remember, <clears throat> the UNPRI is a transnational body that's not elected and not accountable, but they are actively getting their members to change government policy in sovereign nations without any reference to the people or the elected officials. So in addition to these influences on financial markets, major carbon trading houses like Goldman Sachs have many alumni associated with major universities. Alumni donations make up an important part of university funding. Major academic pension plans are signatory to the UNPRI and their policies reflect the onus to observe environmental, social and governments, a governance ESG standards which are prescribed by this unelected, unaccountable transnational organization that wields enormous financial power. Major municipal, state and national union funds, many of which have huge unfunded liabilities, are also deeply invested in climate change, low carbon industries. Testing the polar bear climate crisis claims in person. Zach Unger had graduated in the US with a degree in environmental science and a desire to save the planet. He and his family lived a low carbon lifestyle in Oakland, California. The persistent media stories and imagery of hungry, drowning polar bears drove him to do his own research. He moved his entire family to Churchill, Manitoba, Canada, polar bear capital of the world, to get first-hand information and experience, only to find out that things were not what they seemed in the media, and he wrote a book about it. Unger, 2013. Coincident to Unger's discovery that polar bears had multiplied and not diminished, could eat snow geese or each other if they were hungry, and that neither case was necessarily a sign of existential distress, investors were also finding out that their efforts to save the planet by investing in clean tech was a noble way to lose money, as Joseph Deere said. He was then CIO of pension fund giant CalPERS, and he told that to the Wall Street Journal in 2013, citing 9.7% annualized losses since 2007. Even Mark Carney, governor of the Bank of England, whose much cited Tragedy of the Horizon speech to Lloyds of London of September 29, 2015, when fact-checked, was revealed to be providing a failure of analysis. In summary, here's a quote. One of the few convincing suppositions about polar bears fishing comes from Labrador's White Bear River. There, in 1775, the English fur trader and adventurer Captain George Cartwright found thousands of fish carcasses and polar bear tracks, good evidence of the behavior and the territory's extreme southern parts. And that's from How Polar Bears Became Dragons of the North smithsonian.com. The thought of starving, drowning polar bears has touched the hearts of millions and taken millions from their wallets, as Wind Aware Ireland reported in November of 2017. Though internet blogs may be written by individuals who are mocked by Harvey et al. as denialists, clearly there's lots to question. The true keystone dominoes of the story are found in the broken cornerstones of evidence that dispute 
the allegedly settled science of the AGW GHG theory of climate change. That's the carbon dioxide drives climate change theory. And the tremendous global financial influence based on outdated science. The climate change catastrophe cult of Knut is dead. Taxing or trading carbon is unlikely to save a single polar bear or the planet. But for acolytes of a cult, even in death, there's hope for resurrection. For climate catastrophists and carbon traders locked in a cargo cult of their own making, the faint hope is the vapid Paris Agreement. For climate change polar bear cultists, a U.S. professor proposed cloning Knut. So, just to let you know, this is a, an independent work. I do acknowledge that I am the communications manager for Friends of Science Society. Uh, I was not funded or directed in any way to write this paper. I did it of my own volition. And Friends of Science Society was one of the denialist blogs noted in the Harvey et al. 2017 paper. Now, one further note on the Harvey et al. paper. One of the authors, actually, at the time, just about the time that it was released, also released a children's book called The Tantrum That Shook the World. And it was about a little girl who went and had a tantrum about climate change um, at City Hall and all over the place. And it's kind of funny in the world of climate change how two years later a little girl ended up at the UN saying, how dare you, having a tantrum about climate change. <laughs> but maybe that's just a coincidence. So I hope you enjoyed the paper. And uh, feel free to subscribe and put some comments down below. I usually go through the comments and try and respond as best I can. And we'd love to have you support us, become a member of Friends of Science. Um, you can do that on our website. Uh, it's a nominal sum of money and we send you newsletters and reports and uh, keep you up to date on what's going on in the world that you'll never hear in the mainstream media. So um, thanks very much for tuning in. For Friends of Science Society, I'm Michelle Sterling. Hey, Knut, want to go outside and play in the snow? <laughs> He's a cutie, isn't he?